Welcome all. In today's session, you are going to look at the brachioplexus, um, which is a content of the axilla. And uh, by the end of this session, you should know how the brachioplexus is formed. You should also be able to draw the brachioplexus without reference. So you should practice this until it becomes part of you. And we we'll also look at some clinical correlations. Welcome all. My name is Wallis Moneri and I'm the Uredactari. So let's start. Now, let me hide this. Okay. Okay, now. The brachial plexus is a plexus of nerves found on the, which is formed by the ventral rami of the lower four cervical and the first thoracic um, spinal nerves. That is from C5 to T1. So um, the ventral rami of C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 participate in the formation of the brachial plexus with little contribution from uh, C4 and T2. Okay. Now, Really, there might be um, a significant contribution of the to the brachial plexus by the anterior uh, ramus of um, C4. When that uh, contribution is significant, there is a reduction in the contribution by T1. And such brachial plexus is known as a prefixed brachial plexus. Okay? Alternatively, if we have a prefixed plexus, we also have a postfixed plexus in uh, another uh, in in a population of in a certain population in in a post fix there is a substantial contribution from t2 and uh, the input from c5 is diminished okay um other variations may occur in the manner of the formation of the trunks these are the components now of the brachial plexus the trunks division cords where the contribution of the spinal cord segments to the branches remain constant okay now let's Let's look at that. Now, components of the brachial plexus. Now, the brachial plexus has four components. We first start with the roots. The roots uh, will combine to form the trunks. Then the trunks divide to form divisions. Then the divisions combine to form cords. Then from the cords, you will have your branches. Okay. Now, the roots and the trunks are usually located in the neck. The divisions lie behind the clavicle. The cords lie in the axilla. So, in fact, it is the cords of the brachial plexus, uh, uh, which are the contents of the, is one of the contents of the axilla. Now, of the five roots of the plexus, that is C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, the upper two unite, that is C5 unites with C6 to form the upper trunk. Then the lower two unite, um, that is C8 and T1 unite to form the lower trunk. Now the central root, that is C7, runs as the middle trunk. Please understand that. Now I will show you that in a diagram shortly. Now then the five roots usually lie behind the um, scalinus anterior muscle and uh, emerge uh, from, uh, emerge between it, they usually emerge um, between uh, scalinus anterior and scalinus media, medius um, to form the trunks, which close the lower part of the posterior triangle of the neck. Then each of the three trunks divides into an anterior and posterior division behind the clavicle. So each trunk must divide. There are three trunks, upper trunk, middle trunk, lower trunk. Each divides to an anterior and posterior division. Then. Here at the outer border of the first rib, the upper two, listen to this, the upper two anterior trunks, that is the anterior trunk of the um, upper trunk and middle trunk, they will unite to form the lateral cord. Then the anterior division of the lower trunk will run as the medial cord, while all three posterior divisions, all the posterior divisions unite to form one cord, the posterior cord. Okay, then... The, uh, these three cords enter the axilla above the first part of the artery. Um, if you have looked at the video of the axilla part one, I said that uh, there is a, how they are related. Um, the, the posterior and the lateral cord 
they usually lie um, superolateral to the first part of axillary artery, where the middle cord lies posterior to the first part of the axillary artery, okay? Then when they approach the second part of the axilla, they usually lie in their respective positions. So the, the medial cord will lie medial to the artery, lateral cord, lateral, posterior cord, posterior to the artery. Then uh, at, they usually give off their branches around the third part of the axillary artery, okay? Now, the roots, thus, the roots are uh, between the scaline, the scaline muscles, that is scalina anterior and medias, trunks in the posterior triangle of the neck, divisions behind the clavicle, cords in the axilla and branches, but the branches will exit the axilla to go to the upper limb. Now, let's look at that in a diagram. Now, these are the roots, these are the trunks, these are the divisions, these are the cords, and these are the branches. Now, you can see the upper two, C5, C6, combined to form the upper trunk. C7 runs around as the middle trunk. C8, T1 combined to form the lower trunk or the inferior trunk. Then each trunk will give off an anterior and a posterior division. Then the anterior divisions of the upper and the middle trunk combine to form the lateral cord. Then the anterior division, the anterior division of the lower trunk will run as the medial cord. Then all the three posterior cords, uh, posterior divisions, sorry, all the three posterior divisions unite to form the posterior cord. Then they will give off their branches. Now let's continue. Now, these roots, uh, that is C5, C6, C7, um, C8, and T1, they have branches. Now, three branches from the roots, which uh, include the dorsoscapular nerve, nerve to subclavius, and the, the long thoracic nerve, arise successively from C5, that is dorsoscapular, C5, C6, that is the nerve to subclavius, then C5, C6, C7, that is the long thoracic nerve, or the nerve to serratus anterior muscle. Now, and uh, they usually pass, this is how they pass. The nerve, uh, the dorsoscapular nerve will pass uh, downwards behind, okay? Then the nerve to subclavius will pass in front and the long thoracic nerve will pass behind the roots, okay? Now, let's look at the dorsoscapular nerve, also known as the, the nerve to the rhomboids. Arises from the posterior aspect of C5, pierces scalinus medius muscle, uh, course downwards, a line anterior to levator scapulae, then, and also a line, but line on the posterior surface of uh, serratus posterior superior muscle. Then it is accompanied by the dorsoscapular vessels. It usually supplies the romb rhomboids. Uh, rhomboids uh, refers to the rhomboid as major and minor, and uh, it will also give a branch to levator um, scapulae. It does not supply scalinus medius, even though it pierces that muscle. It does not. Okay, please understand that. Then we have the nerve to subclavius, which arises from the C5, where the roots of C5 and C6 unite. Um, in fact, you'll find some text saying that uh, the nerve to subclavius um, is a branch from the uh, superior trunk. Um, but uh, when you use the text which I've used, um, uh, where I used for reference, um, the nerve to subclavius is considered as uh, also apart from uh, as a branch from the roots. Now, it usually arises from the roots of C5 and C6 where they join to form the upper trunk, but it passes down in front of the trunk and the, and the subclavian vessels to enter the posterior surface of subclavius muscle. Now, frequently it has a branch known as the accessory phrenic nerve, which connects the phrenic nerve, providing an alternative route uh, for some fibers from the fifth cervical anterior ramus to reach the diaphragm. Now, Remember phrenic nerve uh, root values C3, C4, C5. Now, if these branches, uh, if these fibers from C5 do not uh, come directly from this root, uh, from the roots, that is from the C5 root, um, they, they can pass through this nerve, nerve to subclavius, then they, they will be given off to um, phrenic nerve. Then we have the wrong thoracic nerve or the nerve to serratus anterior. Arises on the posterior aspect of C5, C6, C7. Now, but the branches of C5 and C6 usually enter um, scalinus medius muscle first. They unite and they emerge, they emerge as a single trunk, which passes down into the axilla. Now, on the surface of serratus anterior, that is, uh, remember the serratus anterior is uh, the medial wall of the axilla. It is joined by the branch from C7 
which has descended, which has descended in front of um, Scalinus medius. Okay, so C seven does not uh, pierce um, Scalinus, Scalinus medius, but C five, C six pierce, form a single trunk. Then C C seven will uh, pass in front of um, Scalinus medius, and uh, it will join the the single trunk from C five, C six as it rises on the um, serratus anterior uh, muscle. Here we are, you can see this is C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. You can see the branches from um, C, um, C5 here. You have your dorsal scapula or the nerve thromboids. Then you, here you can see to phrenic nerve. If this does not come out here, okay? If this does not, this branch does not uh, emerge from here, the fibers can follow this route, can come first to the nerve to subclavius, then they will emerge and join the phrenic nerve. Then you can see um, these are the long thoracic nerve here from C5, C6, C7. Okay. Then we have um, and this. You can see the nerve to subclavius just where the two um, the two um, roots, the, uh, the C5 and C6 are joining. That is where it is emerging from. Then Let's go to the branches from the trunks. Okay, now it is only one branch. If 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 uh, if um, let's go back. If you consider the nerve to subclavius will emerge from is emerging from the roots, then uh, it you will not consider it uh, as emerging from the upper trunk. Okay, so branch from the trunks, the suprascapular nerve that is arises on the upper trunk in the lower part of the posterior triangle of the neck, then passes backwards and laterally deep to um, the border of trapezius muscle. Then it passes through the suprascapular foramen um, that is beneath the superior transverse scapular ligament and uh, will surprise your supraspinatus muscle. Then descends lateral to the scapular spine with the suprascapular vessels. Remember the suprascapular artery um, from the thylosophical trunk of the, from the um, first part of um, subclavian artery. Um, then it will also supply um, uh, infraspinatus muscle. Um, it also supplies, um, it has articular twigs, articular branches to shoulder and uh, acromioclavicular joints. Here we are. Here it is. You can see this is your transverse scapular ligament here. So it will descend. This is your supraspinatus muscle here. Then this is your scapular spine, then lateral to it, it will pass along here to, to supply also your infraspinatus. Now this, this is your, you can see there is this which is passing underneath, then there is this other structure. This is now your suprascapular um, artery. It has, it, it must have an accompanying um, vein. Now, which are the branches from the lateral cord now? Three branches arise from the lateral cord. That is lateral pectoral nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, and the lateral root of median nerve. Now, the lateral pectoral nerve pierces clavi pectoral fascia to surprise your pectoralis major muscle with the fibers C5, C6, C7. Okay, then it communicates across the front of the first part of axillary artery with the medial pectoral nerve and through this um, communication we will also supply your pectoralis minor. It has no cutaneous distribution. Musculocutaneous nerve leaves the lateral cord quite high in the axilla. That is a very important point. Runs obliquely downwards and uh, pierces corocobrachialis muscle giving an articular uh, giving a twig to supply it, okay? So it first gives a branch to supply the muscle, then pierces the muscle. Then after passing, uh, before passing the through the muscle, that is, then lower down in the arm, it supplies your biceps brachii and uh, your brachialis muscle and uh, becomes your lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, okay? Or your lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerve. Then, now, what, why did I say that uh, it usually leave, it usually exit the axilla quite high? This is why. Now, an anesthetic solution injected through the floor of the axilla to affect the brachial plexus nerve block may not affect the musculocutaneous nerve. Why? It has a high takeoff from the lateral cord. So, 
if you are if you inject the anesthetic solution through the floor of the axilla um, it might not take effect on the musculocutaneous nerve then we have the lateral root of median nerve which is a continuation um, of the lateral cord c5 to c7 it is joined and it is joined by the medial root of the median nerve that is from the medial cord c8 t1 to, uh, and the two roots usually embrace the artery um, and when the arm is pulled down to depress the shoulder, uh, uh, in, in some cases, it might compress the, um, the auxiliary artery. At first, the median nerve usually lie um, lateral to, to the artery, then uh, it will cross it and lie midi. In the, uh, when we look at the arm, you see that? Here's the brachial plexus. Wow. Now, I want you to first uh, please identify this. If you are ever given this diagram, please identify the M, the magical M, this M, the one I'm drawing here. That, if, if once you identify that, your work becomes easy, becomes wow. Now this muscle here, is your crocobrachialis muscle. Now, which nerve pierces? Musculocutaneous nerve. Then, this here, this here, this is your median nerve. So, this is the lateral root of median nerve. This is the medial root uh, of median nerve here. So, lateral root, medial root. Then, this is the terminal branch from the medial cord of brachial plexus, your ulnar nerve. Okay. Okay. And uh, maybe from here you can see um, how these were formed. This is C5. We rejoin with C6, upper trunk. Um, this will run alone. C7 run alone as the medial, uh, medial trunk. Uh, then uh, C8 and the uh, T1 here from your lower trunk. Then they will, uh, as, as, as I have said, they will combine uh, in that order. You can, you can pause the video and uh, look at these images that you can and uh, know what each structure is. Okay? Please pause the video and look at each structure. Know each structure like, like this. This is your scalinus anterior muscle. If you see a nerve which is lying anterior to your scalinus anterior, that is your phrenic nerve. Story of another day. Now, which are the branches from the medial cord? Five branches emerge from the medial cord. That is your medial pectoral nerve, your medial head of, or your medial root of medial nerve, your ulnar nerve, and the two um, cutaneous nerve. That is the um, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Now, the medial pectoral nerve arises from the medial cord, uh, root value C81, behind the first part, uh, uh, behind the first part of auxiliary artery, uh, and is joined by the communication from the lateral pectoral nerve. Then it, it enters the deep surface of pectoralis minor, giving a branch to supply it, uh, giving a branch to supply it and it does so before um, perforating the muscle, then enters the pectoralis major where it ends by supplying the lower costal fibers. It may give a direct branch to um, pectoralis major and in which case it will pass around the lower margin of pectoralis minor. Now, the medial pectoral nerve as the rat also as the lateral pectoral nerve, no cutaneous distribution. Now, the medial and the lateral pectoral nerves are named in accordance with their origins from the median lateral cords of the brachial plexus. Okay, now note this. Remember, um, the pectoralis major muscle is supplied by C5, is supplied by the lateral and by also the medial pectoral nerve. Remember the lateral pectoral nerves, root values C5, C6, C7, medial pectoral C8, T1. So, pectoralis major is the only muscle of the is the only muscle which is supplied by all segments of the brachial plexus, okay? And that is important because you can use that to diagnose, to diagnose injuries of the brachial plexus, okay? Okay, 
Then we have the medial root of the medial nerve, which is a continuation of the medial cord. Fiber CHT1 crosses the axillary artery to form the lateral root to form the medial nerve, which we rely um, lateral to um, axillary artery. Then we have the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. It is the smallest and the most medial of all branches. Okay. In fact, it usually rely medial to axillary vein. It usually runs down on the medial side of the axillary vein to supply the skin over the front and the medial side of the arm. I had said that. And now, then you have the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm is a larger uh, branch than the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, which runs down um, between the artery and the vein. Um, that This is the axillary artery and the axillary vein in front of the ulnar nerve and supplies the skin over the lower part of the arm and uh, the medial side of the forearm. Then ulnar nerve, largest branch of the medial cord, okay, C7, CHT1, runs um, down between the artery and the uh, vein. Uh, that is line between line medial to axillary artery, but lateral to axillary vein. Uh, as, as the most um, posterior of the structures which run down the medial side of the flexor compartment of the arm, it, uh, yeah, it, may, it may receive its C7 fibers as a branch from the lateral cord if the C7 fibers had not passed to the medial cord from the anterior rami of um, C7, okay? You might find in some people um, the ulnar nerve is receiving um, a branch from the lateral cord. Okay, those are C7 fibers. If they had not passed to the medial cord from the anterior ramus of um, C7, here we are. This is your medial cord. You can see the medial pectoral nerve. You can see the communication between the lateral pectoral and the medial pectoral. Then you have the uh, medial brachial cutaneous nerve. That is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. Then the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve, that is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Then the terminal branch here, ulnar nerve, okay. Then we have the medial root of median nerve. Then branches from the posterior cord. Now, five branches usually arise from the posterior cord. That is up, upper subscapular nerve, the racodosal nerve, also known as your nerve to latissimus dorsi muscle, lower subscapular nerve, um, auxiliary nerve, uh, I, will, I will not use circumflex nerve. It was initially known as circumflex nerve, but that name um, was dropped. Um, then you have your radial nerve. Now, upper subscapular nerve, it is just a small nerve um, which enters the upper part of subscapularis muscles to separate. Then you have your thoracodosal nerve or your nerve to latissimus dorsi, which is a large nerve which runs down the posterior axillary wall crosses the lower, uh, lower border of um, teres major to enter the deep surface of ratismus dorsi muscle um, at the um, well, form, uh, well, well forward near the border um, of the muscle. It uh, comes from high up um, behind the subscapular artery, but as it descends to enter the muscle, it rises in front of the artery. At this level, um, called the um, thoracodosal artery, okay? Remember the subscapular artery, after giving off the um, circumflex scapular artery, um, it continues as the thoracodosal nerve. Now, the thoracodosal, uh, sorry, the thoracodosal artery. Now, the thoracodosal nerve will lie in front of that artery, and it is thrown into prominence in the, in the position of lateral rotation and abduction of the humerus and thus it is usually in danger in operation of the lower axilla so you should safeguard that nerve during operations of the axilla to prevent um regions to, uh, to that nerve then you have the lower subscapular nerve which is larger than the upper subscapular it uh, supplies the lower part of subscapularis muscle and also supplies um your teres major muscle Okay, let's continue to the last two branches of the posterior cord. The axillary nerve, formerly known as the circumflex nerve, it is one of the large, uh, one, one of the two large terminal branches of the posterior cord. The other is the uh, radial nerve, which we will look. Then the axillary nerve surprised nothing in the axilla, despite its name having been changed from circumflex to axillary. You don't, uh, and I cannot tell you why they changed. Now, from its origin, it usually ran backwards through the uh, quadrangular space. I will look. I will do a video on these spaces. 
uh, which is bordered by um, subscapillaries above, teres major below, um, the long head of triceps, um, brachii medially, and the surgical neck of humerus laterally. Then it then um, it then passes just below the capsule of the shoulder joint uh, with the posterior circumflex humeral vessel, vessels below it. Then emerges at the back of the uh, at the back of the axilla below um, teres minor. Having given a branch to the shoulder joint, it divides into anterior and posterior divisions. Now the anterior, uh, sorry, anterior and posterior branches. The anterior branch winds round behind the humerus in contact with the periosteum of the humerus and uh, enters the deep surface of deltoid muscle to separate. Then a few terminal twigs pierce the muscle and uh, reach the skin. So it has a, a cutaneous distribution. Now the posterior branch, uh, surprise teres minor and deltoid then wides um, around the posterior border of deltoid to become um, the upper lateral um, cutaneous nerve of the arm. So all those stories, uh, please understand them. Then we have the radio nerve, which is a continuation of the posterior cord and it is the largest branch of the brachial plexus. Um, it usually cross, uh, crosses the lower border of um, posterior axillary wall uh, line on the glistening tendon of ratismus dorsi. Okay, so this is what will help you. If you see a tendon, and the, the tendon of ratismus dorsi, remember, is the one responsible for the formation of your posterior axillary fold. If you see a nerve line there, that, that, that is your radio nerve. Then it passes out of sight through the triangular space below the lower border of, um, and uh, below the lower border, uh, below the lower border of this tendon as it lies in front of the teres major between the long head of triceps and the humerus. Now, before disappearing, it gives the nerves to supply the long heads, uh, the long head of triceps, uh, triceps brachii, that is, and the medial head, um, a nerve which um, accompanies the ulnar nerve along the medial side of the arm. Then it has a cutaneous branch which supplies the skin along the posterior um, surface of the arm, that is the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm, also known as the posterior um, brachial, um, posterior brachial cutaneous nerve. Here we are, posterior cord formed by the all the posterior divisions. Then it will give off your upper subscapular nerve. Then this is your nerve to latissimus dorsi or your thoracodorsal nerve. Then your lower subscapular nerve, then the terminal branches, axillary nerve, and your radio nerve, which is the largest branch of the whole plexus. This will pass through your um, quadrangular space, okay? Uh, radio nerve will pass through your lower triangular space. Okay, here we are, maybe for you to see what, what did I want to show you here? Uh, the radio nerve, this is the radio nerve here. Sorry, this is your auxiliary nerve. This is your radio nerve. Okay, you can see they are even lying posterior to auxiliary artery. These are branches from your posterior cord, and this is your posterior cord here. Okay, okay, this is your long thoracic nerve. Remember C5, C6, C7 from the roots. Okay. Now, clinical correlations. We have injuries to the plexus. We have upper plexus injury, which is the abs, abs paralysis. It is caused by an excessive increase in the angle between the head and the shoulder, which may occur from a occur uh, by a fall from the from the um, back of a horse and you ride on your shoulder or a traction of the arm during the birth of a child. So as long as the injury is causing an increase in the angle between the head and the shoulder, that is that will cause an injury to the upper trunk. That is C5, C6 will be affected, which will lead to a typical deformity of the limb called policeman's tip or tips. Policeman's tip hand, also known as the porter's tip hand or the waiter's tip hand. Uh, the, the affected person will look like a policeman who is taking a tip, a bribe. Uh, you will see that. In this deformity, the arm will hang at the side. It is adducted, okay, and it is medially rotated. 
Then the forearm is extended and pronated. So, so why is the arm adducted? Because there is paralysis of the deltoid muscle. Why is there um, medial rotation? So if, if there is paralysis of the deltoid, which muscle will be taking, uh, we, we, we cause the adduction, your pectoralis major. Medial rotation of the arm due to paralysis of the foreign muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Extension of the elbow due to paralysis of your biceps, your biceps break time. Pronation of the forearm due, due to paralysis of also of the um, biceps break time. Also, there is a loss of sensation, which is minimal along the outer aspect of the arm due to the involvement of the roots of um, C6 spinal nerve. This is how it will look. If you look at this chart, you can see the arm is adducted, medially rotated, the forearm is extended, and then it is pronated. It is like uh, this position is trying to take, it's like a policeman uh, who wants a bribe, a tip, okay? That is why it is called the policeman's tip, hand or the potter's. Then we have the, your crumb. Uh, your crump case paralysis, is, which is the lower plexus injury caused by the hyper abduction of the arm, which may occur when one falls on an outstretched hand or the arm is pulled into a machinery. Or during delivery, um, you find uh, instead of uh, delivering using the head, they, they, they use the arm, they pull the arm. Now, the extended arm in a bridge um, presentation, that is, now, the nerve roots involved in this injury are the CH2 T1, the lower trunk, and sometimes C7. Now, the clinical features of crumb case paralysis are as follows. Crow hand. Why? Paralysis of the flexors of the wrist and the fingers. Remember, uh, yes, that is C6, C7, mm, C8, and all intrinsic muscles of the hand. That is will cause a crow hand. Also, there is loss of sensation around the medial border of the forearm and the hand because of involvement of the T1. Then there is Horner's syndrome, which is due to involvement of the sympathetic fibers, which are supplying the head and neck, uh, that is, which leave the spinal cord through T1. Um, Horner's syndrome is characterized by partiotosis. This is the drooping of eyelids. Why will, will there be partiotosis? Because um, due to involvement of the, the smooth muscle component of the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. That smooth muscle component is known as the mulus muscle. Why? Then there will be meiosis, which is, um, um, which is uh, a constriction of the pupil, okay? Because uh, the sympathetic, um, sympathetic uh, supply to the ciliary ganglion has been uh, affected, then there will be and hydrosis and the uh, and of thermos. This you run when you look at the um the the autonomic nervous system. So here we have the differences between abs paralysis and crumb case paralysis. Please post the video here at this point. Go through them. I won't. So thank you for your attention, and uh, please subscribe for more anatomy and biochemistry content. Thank you.